My name is John Halstead. Uh, I'm with Pixar Animation Studios, and I was the supervising technical director on Finding Dory. When my mom asks me that question, uh, what I tell her is I'm the general contractor for a film. And what that means is you can imagine the director um, is the client. He owns the house we're going to build. And the art and story departments are the architects. And I'm the guy who's responsible for making sure everything gets built to the satisfaction of the director. And so what that means is um, I help set the technology direction on the film. And then I help lead and support the technical departments in building the characters, the sets, the effects, the simulation, all of that. Um, you know, I think practically every film at Pixar goes through a period where it is absolutely terrible. It is just, you know, not a good movie. And um, we have a knack of, and I really should say, you know, especially our story departments, our directors, have, have a knack of just continuing to, to work on a story and refine it until it gets out of that state and it starts becoming something that, that we're really proud of. Um, and I would say on Dory, um, uh, it was a long time when the movie wasn't very good. And I think personally, I started feeling really good about the film uh, last November. And uh, we had done enough iteration on the story and worked out a lot of problems that it was really starting to, to take shape. Like, wow, this, this could be a very impactful movie. Um, because I, I think it is a very special movie. There, there's some beautiful themes about, um, you know, self-reliance and, you know, like any parent, the concern that you have for your children and, um, and trusting in yourself uh, that, um, you know, it's, it's, it, when we were starting to be able to uncover those themes and, and make them clearer, um, I really felt like, you know, the movie was going to be great. When I first started the film back in the fall of 2012, Hank was already a character in the script. And it was very clear from the script that he was going to be a, a major character. And, um, and in talking with Andrew, he was, we discussed, you know, what he wanted out of Hank's performance. and. Um, you know, he was looking for a character that um, had its, you know, foot based in reality, so that, you know, a character that had very fluid movement, like an octopus, but caricature. Um, and, of course, he was looking for a character with a lot of appeal, because, um, you know, what we're trying to do in the film is uh, connect with our audiences through our characters. And, you know, to, to base a character on octopus, um, you know, octopuses are, are very interesting, and, uh, but there's also, there's kind of a, a gross out quality to them a little bit too, especially when they get out of the water and they look all slimy and they're kind of flopping around and Hank is in and out of the water throughout the film. Um, so uh, there was, uh, not only was there uh, a challenge in terms of like how do we caricature this really fluid motion that you see in nature, but there was a challenge in just making him appealing, um, and uh, you know that the kind of the mantra from Andrew is like, if you're trying to decide you know what what to do if you do something with Hank, you know always keep in mind don't make him gross, and so we kind of keep that in mind especially when we're working with Sim and you have a lot of flexibility over how jiggly a character is. Um, we always that was kind of a guiding principle to, to kind of help hone in on the character. Well, you know, with Hank, uh, you know, we had a wonderful art department, and they were really able to kind of you know blaze a trail or, or set the table for him for us, for so to speak. And um, at, there was a point though with really any character that you've got to get him out of art, and you got to get him into the computer and into animation's hands. Because what ends up happening is, and it happened with Hank, you get him into 3D, you start posing him with animation, and you start finding all these problems. And if you look at, you know, what the final design of Hank coming out of the art department was compared to what the final result is up on the screen, there's some pretty big differences. Um, and a lot of that is driven by um, 
the collaboration between characters and animation and, and doing uh, a lot of animation tests to kind of flesh out, you know, how does this character move? How does that reflect his personality? In doing that, do we discover something else that's really interesting about Hank? And, you know, in this discovery process, you end up, you know, making course corrections. And, you know, in our case, we, we might, um, you know, make the eyes a little bit bigger to make it more appealing or, you know, thicken up his, his arms. And in, in Hank's case, actually remove an arm so you can accommodate, you know, thicker arms. And uh, so it's, you know, it's definitely, an, it's an evolution as you're working with it. You discover stuff that you, you want to change. You know, it, our animation team is responsible for crafting the performance for our characters. And uh, what we found with Hank is because he's so complex and he's got, you know, so many different arms is um, even though we, we worked really hard to get the controls to a point where animation can reason about them and we feel like we haven't overbuilt the rig, still a lot of complexity to manage there. And so um, what our animators found is the, the way they work they'll get a, a kicked off on a shot from the director and then they need to um, quickly you know test out different ideas on, on, on what the performance could be for the character and the quicker they can do that get it in front of the director and and, and choose a direction um, you know the quicker they'll, they'll be done with the shot and move on to the next thing so uh, what they found with Hank was because of his complexity they, they ended up taking a, an approach of 2d animation where they would actually turn off Hank's arms when, uh, and then they, they would draw them in uh, on top of uh, animating his body. So they could um, not have to deal with the complexity of, of all the arm motion and just try out ideas with um, you know, 2D drawings more quickly. And then once they got a buy off from the director, uh, they, in terms of like, okay, this is what the performance is going to be. Then they could spend a week or so going back in and transferring that 2D animation to the actual rig. A lot of our characters, we will uh, do a flesh simulation, and um, we've been doing that for a while now. And if, if you look at, uh, you know, go back whether it's a good dinosaur or um, you know the, the bear on Brave. Um, there's uh, some subtle secondary animation in kind of the, the fleshier parts of the character, just to help bring them more alive. And then uh, there's also another technology called, uh, that we call skin sim, which uh, basically approximates skin sliding uh, along the surface of the character as they move. Um, and again, that's just to try to help loosen up the performance and bring a little more life. But, um, it's, uh, it's always in service of the story and the animation, and so we, we have to kind of watch and you know, make sure that it's not either too little or too much, it's just right to, to, to augment the performance and not distract. One of the big challenges on the film is rendering all this water and glass. And you know, back on Nemo, we had a, you know, a six month project with a team of people trying to figure out how to render the one tank in the dentist office convincingly. Um, and so with Dory taking place in an aquarium, we had tanks all over the place and, you know, we can't afford to spend, you know, just six months on a single tank. And so, um, what we, uh, and we wanted all the glass and water to look great. And so, um, what we decided to do was, um, to adopt the, the new path tracer from our renderman team. And, um, and what that meant for us is that by, uh, with path tracing, you get a more accurate simulation of light uh, as light behaves in the real world. And so when you're rendering glass and water, the reason they look the way they do is because of all the complex reflection and refraction that, that's happening with the light. And so by moving to path tracing, uh, all of a sudden, we were able to create these scenes with multiple layers of glass and water and out of the box get um, these really beautiful results. And, and what was great about that is I never had to go to the director and say, oh, you know, we, we can't do this. You know, we, we just arbitrarily throw a lot of this stuff together. And then, uh, you know, we could take the results of the renderer and we could push and pull the aspects of it that we wanted to. But uh, it was very freeing to start in the place grounded in the real world when we were rendering, you know, glass and water on the film. You know, I think of like Inside Out, and um, 
there was this really neat juxtaposition between you know the world of Riley and the mind world. And the world of Riley, it, it looks pretty realistic. Um, it's not photoreal, but I mean, there's a naturalism to it. Whereas you go to the mind world, and that doesn't look photoreal at all. And it's it's always all we're doing. We're, it's everything's in, in service of the story. And uh, you know, when you're doing you know water effects, we tend to like the way that you know realistic water looks like. So we like to kind of push that. At the same time, when you have an octopus like Hank, you want to caricature it um, so he's appealing to the audience. And so I think the goal is not photorealism, the, the goal is to give us as much flexibility in the look of our films as we can possibly get, so we can tell all sorts of different stories. You know, from a story perspective, um, I don't think I can really speak to, you know, what makes a great character. I know that one of the goals of Pixar is to make our characters as appealing as possible. Whether or not they're, they're good or bad, um, there still needs to be an overall appeal to them. And because we want you to understand what our characters are feeling, and we, we want you to want to empathize with them, and it's all part of, you know, building this connection with the audience. From a technical point of view, what makes a good character is uh, one that um, has the the appropriate um, you know rig or, or, or set of controls and animation can uh, take their vision of, of what they want the performance to look like and realize it on the screen. So if they're not stumbling over the technology, you know the the character has been created in such a way that they can express themselves through it. Um, and I think ultimately, I mean, that's probably, you know, the biggest key for an appealing, uh, what makes a great character. Um, and then, you know, the decisions you make in terms of building it affects the pipeline throughout, you know, not just animation, but, you know, if you have to do simulation with it, um, you know, is it easier or hard to work with? You've got to like the thing, can you, can you like this thing? in a way, with different lighting setups, and he, and he looks consistently through that. So, um, you know, from my perspective as a technical supervisor, I want to make sure the character has the, the traits needed by all the different departments for them to, to do their craft. Yeah, you know, what I would really love to see is um, continued improvement in, you know, our day-to-day -day tool set in terms of interactivity and feedback. Um, and we've made great strides in that, right? I mean, um, being able to, um, you know, get real-time feedback and, and just with our, our rigs and animation um, allows our artists to get into, you know, a flow of working that um, they can, they, they don't have to stumble across the technology, you know, they can, they can think more freely and be more creative. So there's that and that that kind of approach across all of our departments, whether it's, um, you know, shading or, or lighting or simulation, I think yeah, all of us would benefit from tools that would provide faster feedback and interactivity. And with that, what I would love to see is um, the ability to, 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 to be able to take on projects where you don't need such a huge crew, but you, you could do smaller projects. They don't have to be blockbuster movies, but could be, um, you know, offer an opportunity to other voices at the studio to tell stories that, um, because of the technology allows for, you know, more agile crews to, um, you know, to, to make these films. Oh, Viva has been an absolutely wonderful conference. My first time. And, um, of course, Turin is a charming city to be in. It's my first time in Italy. But what I think I've appreciated the most about the conference is being able to, to visit with a lot of people that I think uh, in other venues uh, wouldn't have been possible. And so, um, you know, visiting with, you know, the people that are presenting as well as the people that are, are here to, to learn and listen to the talks has uh, just been really rewarding.